If you have your Bibles with you, let me encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. You know, I have to, I have to apologize to TJ a little bit. I uh, sat right dead smack in the middle, in the front row. And then as we were singing, I've known you by a thousand names, I just had to bow my head. And just as we, as we, as I heard you sing each name, I went mentally into the Bible to the passages where those came from and just thought, what an amazing God to communicate himself to us that way. So I probably was a distraction to TJ. He's like, oh, it's right in the middle and you're not singing. But I just, there are times because music is so important to me and I pay attention to the theology and doctrine and words that I just get overcome. And in so many ways, all of that is exactly what we're talking about this morning. I love how God does that. If you have your Bibles open or turned on or clicked to, swiped over to or whatever, Philippians chapter 4, let me encourage you to stand we're going to read a few verses together. We're going to spend probably more time on these verses than you want to. But I hope when we're done, we'll see another key to joy in the Christian life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, speak to our hearts from a passage we know so well. It'd be real easy for us to just phone this in. And just check the block and say, been there, done that, don't need to pay attention. But God, speak to us, not with a new word, because your word is timeless, but with a new application to stir our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I find it interesting, you know, we were just, we just came out of the previous three verses where Paul is talking about conflict in the church. You know, when, a, when there's conflict in a church, you know what the first thing that goes in church is? Joy. Right? Because no longer do I feel that connection to people. When I walk in, all I can think is, you know what? Bill bugs me. <laughs> For those that don't understand, Bill has a pest control business. He kills bugs. It was a small joke. But when we're in friction, when we're in conflict, the, one of the first things that leaves church life is joy. Let me, let me just non-scientific poll. How many of you have ever been in a church with any conflict? Look around the room. Look around the room. How many, how many arms? Now, put your arms down. How many of you are liars? Okay, so, we, we, so that adds a few other hands. Yeah, so chances are pretty good you've either been in a church that's been in conflict, you're in a church in conflict, or someday you're going to be in a church in conflict. Because here's the reality. Churches are made up of imperfect people serving a perfect God. The problem is imperfect people tend to s serve a perfect God imperfectly. Please don't ask me to say that again. And so coming right out of that, right after, and I, and I think there's, Paul, Paul's very, he's masterful. I love the way he does this because he finishes that verse three, reminding us that there is a book of life. What is that book of life? We, we call it the Lamb's book of life or the place where every believer's name has been written for all eternity. 
And from that, then he comes to say, even though there's conflict, even though there's difficulty, rejoice. Now, before we jump too fast past that, Paul's writing this from prison. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, notice he doesn't say rejoice for all the difficulty you go through. He doesn't say rejoice because somebody else is going through difficulty. He says, regardless of what's going on, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now, just quickly do a quick survey back through where we've been. Chapter 1, verse 18. What then? That only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in, in this I rejoice, and I will rejoice. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. He says, but even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Look at verse 28 of chapter 2. Therefore, I sent him, Epaphroditus, all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to you, to me, and it's a safeguard for you. In this passage, in chapter 4, verse 4, we read it two times, and we're going to come across it again in verse 10 of chapter 4. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. This idea of joy has been the foundation of the, all of these weeks that we've been together in this book. And Paul says... Rejoice. Notice he doesn't say, be happy. You know, I, I read a great illustration of what joy is, or maybe an analogy is a better word, of what joy is. It said, joy is like a compass. You can shake it up and get it all turned around, but it's going to turn around and point north when it settles down. Isn't that a great picture? Because some of the scenes that we saw in that video, war and conflict and all of that they they'll shake that compass up won't they i think that's i know that's why paul didn't say be happy that's bobby Farron, right is that the right name don't worry be happy don't worry be happy now he didn't say be happy he said rejoice see the difference between happiness and joy is like the difference between the current that flows on top of the river and the current that flows down deeper or the waves on top of the ocean compared to the calm of the ocean floor another way to say it is joy is a better engine than a caboose happiness is a better caboose than an engine because when we follow jesus Filled with the joy of knowing we're included in his book. He is our savior. We are his kids. And that can never be changed. If you are. So that we have a steadiness that doesn't have to be tossed here and there. You know, one of the things that'll, well, maybe it doesn't you, but it does at times if I'm not careful, if I watch the stock market too closely, I can go up and down and up and down and up and down and down and down and down and down. And, down. and if I'm not careful, I can begin to think that my joy depends on where that what figure that is and its relationship to the previous day see that's placing value in the wrong place do we need money to do things yeah you just heard roger talk about paying off the building we you heard tyson mention that we met another 
we've surpassed another mission offering. Yeah, you heard him say that at the end of last year, we had controlled expenses enough and people had given well enough that we had more money come in than we spent and we were able to put some of that on the building. Do we need money to do things? Absolutely. But if that's what we put our trust in, See, on our money, it says, in God we trust. If we're not careful, we scratch out the word God. And so joy, he says, rejoice in the Lord. I'm reading a book right now by Philip Yancey called The Scandal of Forgiveness. And he he made a statement in there that's really still ping ponging around in my empty head. This is what he said. He said, an infinite, perfect God can only love infinitely and perfectly. Therefore, if you are forgiven, God could never love you more for the things you do. He could also never love you less for the things you do. When we know that our joy, our foundation, our trust is in Him, not us, then the current stills. And the waves, although they're still crashing, don't throw us around like they once did. I had a friend, uh, so many of you know I was in the Navy, I was always on surface ships, well he was always on submarines. And I would make fun of him because I'd say, you know, my job was to keep the ship floating. Yours was to make it sink. (laughs) But do you know that submarine hated being on the surface? Because it wasn't designed for it. It had a round body. And although it had sailplanes and things to stabilize it, it was tossed here and tossed there and tossed here and tossed there. And they would spend as little time on the surface as possible. And they desired more than anything to dive again so that they could get back to the stillness. I think that's a picture. That when our trust is in God, when our trust is in the Lord, and we rejoice in Him, what we find out is we long to be with Him. And we're not tossed as much. What did Paul say in the book of Ephesians? His desire for them was to be fully mature, not tossed here and there by every form of doctrine or teaching of man. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. The problem is, how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I rejoice when the doctor says we've done a scan and we found a tumor? How do I rejoice when we get the phone call, they're gone? How do I rejoice? When we get an email from their employer saying, as of Thursday, you won't have a job anymore. How do I rejoice when the front door opens and my spouse is standing there with a suitcase saying, I just don't love you anymore? How do we rejoice in those moments? Paul's going to give us some help with that. But let me just say on the outset that sometimes theological answers are not the salve for our raw wounds. But when we begin to live those theological answers, the balm of Gilead is applied and the healing begins. 
So you may say today, you don't, you don't understand what I'm going through. And you're right, I don't. But I know the one who does. And listen to what Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be, made, be known to all men. The Lord is near. And I think the key to this whole section, this whole, this whole paragraph is this statement. The Lord is near. There are arguments. I probably have 20 commentaries in my office that will tell you it should be gentleness. I probably have 20 more commentaries on my shelf that says it should be reasonableness. And there's lots of different translations of the word that's used there that I think, in my understanding, should be let your gentleness be known to all people. And here's why. In light of everything else that Paul has said, and in light of the Old Testament and other teachings, for instance, 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says that elders are supposed to be gentle. Elders, hear me say this. Our job is sheep. And you know what happens if you, get, if you get rough with a sheep? It dies. So we're to be gentle with sheep. Titus 3.2, Paul wrote to Titus, all believers should be gentle, and especially with one another. How many times have the conflict that does arise in church come from someone's harsh comment or attitude towards someone? James 3.17 says wisdom is gentle. 1 Peter 2.18 says masters should be gentle. But in light of what Paul's written earlier, I think what he's saying is the person who's gentle is willing to sacrifice his or her personal rights for the sake of others. You say, how does that help me rejoice when I'm the one hurting? Because here's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to turn you in on yourself and make it all about you. How many of you, how many of you have ever been to a pity party? Yeah, usually there's just one, one invitation, right? Now, occasionally, misery loves company, so we might get somebody else in on it. But you know what usually happens when we get somebody else in our pity party? If they care about us, they start trying to get us out. Right? Oh, I can't believe they said that to me. Well, I can't believe they did either. I'd throat punch them. <laughs> no, that's not the kind of friends that really care about you. They would say, now, wait a minute. Yeah, that person said you're ugly, but you know what? God made you. He made you just the way he wanted you to be. And in his eyes, you're beautiful. You ain't just hoping they don't ask for your opinion. I can't believe they told me I'm dumb. You're not dumb. Ask your spouse. They're one of your choices. But here's the thing about... Pity parties. Pity parties are about taking something that's happened out here and turning it inside, and we put it in that blender in our head. Anybody have a blender in their head? Okay, maybe not a blender. Maybe it's just a, 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 a track on repeat. Anybody? How many of you, just, just think about it for a moment. I'm going to get you miserable. How many of you can remember the last insult you received? Can you play it over and over in your head? You're like, great. I thought I'd forgiven that. See, that's what, but that's what, that's what the enemy wants. Because as long as I turn into me, and it's all about me, then the offense can continue. And the difficulty can be perpetuated. But he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Now, we want to say, let your gentleness be known to your friends. But I love the way one commentator said, he said, make this common knowledge to all people. 
Make your desire to be focused on others. Your desire to remember that the Lord is near. Your desire to remember that you're in the book of life. Your desire to remember that you're in God's family and represent Him. Let that be what everyone knows. And then the Lord is near. I really, in in my outline of this whole passage in a class I took recently, um, I outline this whole passage, um, rejoice for the Lord is near, be gentle for the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing for the Lord is near, talk to him about it because the Lord is near and the peace of God will be yours because the Lord is near. We know, we love verses that remind us of the closeness of God. Psalm 34, 18 He's near to the brokenhearted. How many of you have ever leaned on that verse? Psalm 145, 18, he's near to those who call on him. How about James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. See, what he's saying here, though, I believe, is he's saying two things. The Lord is near, meaning he's here. But I think he's also saying the Lord is near, meaning he could show up at any moment. Some of the things that we get twisted up about 10 billion years from now won't matter. Can you believe what she said about the dress I was wearing? We are at war. 10 billion years from now, I don't know what clothes we're wearing. If you look at all the 70s TV shows about the future, it appeared to be white clothes. I don't know. That person didn't pick me for the, for, to teach that Sunday school class, or they didn't let me be a deacon, or they didn't acknowledge my service. 10 billion years from now? When we've spent that long in the presence of God with one another in a new heaven and a new earth with all the effects of the fall gone, is that going to matter? Because I, I don't, this is the way I understand it. You can disagree with me if you want, but I, I believe that scripture teaches plainly that there's going to come a day when we're going to stand, believers are going to stand before the judgment throne of God, not for judgment in, to enter into heaven, but for judgment for the rewards we're going to be given. And those rewards we're going to cast at Jesus' feet and say it was all about you anyway. So maybe you say, well, okay, that was the minor things, but what about cancer? Dying isn't the worst thing that happens to a believer. You say, well, what if, I'm, what if I'm sick along the way? Then you'll find out that God is strong. What if, I'm, what if I'm miserable and a burden to my family? Then they will find out what it means to selflessly serve. We're going to move on. So he says, really another way to say this, as I put on the, on the screen is, stop trying to be Lord. He's near. Talk to him. This is a verse we probably know. How many of you have this memorized? Oh, just me. Okay, uh, so be anxious for nothing, right? But in everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. There is so much here. The word for anxious in this, in this context means to divide the mind. Now think about this. Paul said, be anxious for nothing. Well, that's easy for Paul to say. He was one of those Bible superheroes. He never faced anything difficult. <laughs> Thanks for falling right into that trap. Remember, he's also he's writing from prison but remember he's writing to the philippians and for the philippians think about all they had to be anxious about first of all he's in prison did i mention that and it's possible he's gonna die because that was the way you normally left a roman prison 
They had heard about Epaphroditus' illness. Remember when we read about that? So you heard that he was dead or he was sick? He was sick, almost to the point of death. But God spared him so that I wouldn't have sorrow. There was the antagonism of those outside the church, the attacks of legalists inside the church, attacks of the libertines inside the church, and friction in the church. And Paul says, in the midst of all that, don't be anxious. Talk to him. The problem we have sometimes with the difficulties we face is we try to figure out how to fix them. We spend all our time trying to figure out how to, we talked about this in, in, in our small group this morning, about how we think about prayer as the thing we do when we've tried everything else. Right? So, so okay, God, I got this. And then when it's a flaming mound of brokenness, we say, okay, God, can you do something with this? What if... As Brian Chappell says in his book, Praying Backwards, what if we started with, in Jesus' name, and then told him what we're going through? Now, can we just be clear about something, too? In this passage, it says, let your request be made known to God. We are not informing God. Just, just, just so you know. Right? God, God's not, God doesn't have a little ear tube up in heaven waiting for our prayers so he'll know what's going on with us. That would be a pretty small God, wouldn't it? No, what happens when we voice our prayers to God, whether it's in our head, our heart, or with our voice, whether it's out loud, on our face, standing up, hands raised, weeping in a puddle on the ground, whatever it is, when we are voicing those prayers to God, we realize in that moment He's known all along. So what if we just took stuff to him first. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, which by the way is kind of a generic term for how you speak to a deity, supplication, which is a word that means more of an urgent plea, and then with thanksgiving. The word for thanksgiving there means to uh, give good grace. When we, when we add with thanksgiving to prayer and supplication both, what we find out is that gratitude ends up making prayer more than a list of demands, more than a session of complaints. It becomes worship. And failing to do so can cause us to feel like our prayers are getting no higher than the ceiling and falling back down on our heads. You and I need to be reminded that we serve a God who doesn't need us, but loves us. We serve a God who doesn't need us to tell Him what's going on in our lives, but loves for us to do so. Why? Because it's relationship. And I think sometimes we get anxious for things because we think we don't ever verbalize it and maybe we don't crystallize that thinking, but we get so distracted in our minds that we begin to question whether he's really there. And when we start with Thanksgiving and when we thank God for the things that we ask for, we're reminded of that. All right, we need to move on. We also need to remember he's near, so he'll take care of you until he comes. Look at verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Can we, can just quickly, can you do this? Can you just jump down to verse 9? I know we're not going to, we're going to talk about that next week, Lord willing. Because in verse 9, it says that it finishes out by reminding us that there is a God of peace. The peace of God comes from the God of peace. 
I remember in June of 2001, I had a heart attack. I'd been taking some medicine that was uh, for arthritis, um, for some injuries I have, and, uh, and it gave me a heart attack, which the good news was I was pain-free in my wrist while I was clutching my chest. Um, but I had a heart attack, and I remember I'd wrestled with it all night long, just felt like I had this weight, this, this kind of felt like an air bubble in my chest, and I, I tried hot showers, and I tried all kinds of stuff. I probably drank a 12-pack of Coke and was trying to burp, and I don't know if that's polite to say, but... Um, I was trying to get all that pressure off. And finally in the morning, I told my wife, I said, you know, I got to go into work, uh, but I think I'm going to stop by the VA on the way. Just have them check me out because something's not right. My chest hurts and my left arm is just aching. She said, okay, kiss me. And I went off. I wasn't gone very long before she sat up in bed and realized what I just told her. And she called the VA and told them I was coming. And they met me in the parking lot and they ripped my clothes and threw me on a gurney and wheeled me inside. And I remember I started hearing them say how they put it leads all over me. And I remember hearing them say, he's having a heart attack. We got to do something. And in that moment, I panicked. I mean, visibly, I went into convulsions. I was shaken. They couldn't have hardly hold me down. I just kept thinking, this is it. This is it. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. And and I was trying to pray, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but I'm trying to pray, and my thoughts just won't come, and I'm, I'm just going. And then all of a sudden, I, it wasn't an audible voice. I didn't see a light or anything like that. But all of a sudden, just in my heart, I felt like God said, you know what? It's okay. If I take you now, you've done what I sent you to do. And if I leave you here, there's more for you to do. And in that moment, I can, I can still describe it for you, a calmness just started in my chest and worked its way out into my body and I was able to relax. Now, why? Because I think even though I couldn't pray, God knew my heart was to do so. And he knew in that moment, if I gave in to the panic of that situation, I probably would have killed myself. And so when we are anxious, we don't pray, we don't cry out to God, we certainly aren't thinking about the things we have to be thankful for. We're probably even questioning whether he's there, but when we do, even if we can't voice the words, the peace of God, which makes no sense, I was still having a heart attack. Was able to guard my heart and my mind. I love the idea here of heart and mind. If you look back over this book, and we won't take the time because we're out of time, but if you look over this, what he's saying is the, the thoughts you have and where they come from. It's a way of, it's called a merism in English, but it's where you have an, two bookends and you're supposed to understand that it means everything in between. So we might say he'll guard your, your head to your toe or from your fingertip to your fingertip. But for Paul, it's from your heart to your mind. The word for guard there means literally um, like you would have a guard who was guarding Paul in prison. The Philippians would have known that well. They were a Roman colony that had to deal with Roman guards all the time. But I want to come back to the idea of which surpasses all comprehension. Because this word surpasses is important for Paul. What he wants us to understand here is there will be times that God brings you peace and it just won't make sense. Somebody robbed you and stole all your rent money. Now you don't know how you're going to pay your rent. So that's something to be anxious about. Yeah, it could be. Or it could be something to say, God... You know I have to live. I didn't waste your money. I didn't throw it away. I need your help. And you know what sometimes God does? Sometimes God says, Joe, Bill got robbed. Go help him out. 
Actually, I should have used it the other way. Joe looks like he's been robbed. But (laughs) (laughs) sometimes God will use another believer to come speak into that life or provide or remind. And, And can I just tell you, when God uses you that way, I mean, you may think he's calling you to bless them, but you're going to walk away with the blessing. So, that leads us to some questions where, you know, I always end with questions. So, where is your aim? Where is your aim? Let me, just a quick non-scientific poll. I know I love to do this all the time. I told you the reason I do this is because I'm afraid you're asleep. Um, But how many of you in the last week, in the last week, had more than a fleeting thought of heaven. Okay, some. Maybe we're aiming too low. If the Lord is near, if he's near, what needs to change? Not meaning he's sitting next to you, although that could be near. But if he's so near that he may be here before you take your next breath, what needs to change? say, well, pastor, that's so hard because I have to eat and I have to work to eat, and that takes concentration. I, I get that, and God gets that. But the problem for some of us is we get to the point where we worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. Did you know, this is a crazy guy, I know, I've told you we're going to be done several times and we are, but (laughs) did you know, did you know, you can think of heaven more than for an hour and 20 minutes? On Sunday morning? How many wives raise your hand? How many of you are wives or ever have been or ever hope to be? (laughs) All right. So how how would you like this? Honey, I love you. I want to be married to you forever. I'll see you next Sunday. (laughs) Some of y'all are like, hey, you don't know my husband. (laughs) Um. (laughs) If he's near, what needs to change? If he was here, what would change? See, that's kind of what Paul is saying in this entire passage. But this idea of anxiousness and lack of peace and the pity party and all of that ends up crowding him out of our minds. I read this quote, and I'll close with this. A French soldier in World War I carried this inside his coat into battle with him. Of two things, one is certain. Either you are at the front or you are behind the lines. If you are at the front, of two things, one is certain. Either you are exposed to danger or you are in a safe place. If you're exposed to danger of two things, one is certain. Either you are wounded or you are not wounded. If you are wounded of two things, one is certain. Either you recover or you die. If you recover, there is no need to worry or be anxious. And if you die, you can't worry or be anxious. And I would throw into that just the one alteration if you are in Christ. So, He's near. Is that a good thing? Or is that a bad thing? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. I have to say that every time I come to your word because, God, we wouldn't know you without it. Father, I I just thank you for the privilege of the Holy Spirit living in our hearts so that we can read your word and understand it and have it applied to our hearts and lives. 
so that while you never change, we can, will, and do. Father, my prayer this morning is that if there be anybody here today that in thinking about the imminency of Christ is caused to have concern. I pray that today you would create in us a desire to be yours. A desire to focus on you. Yes, we still have to do our work and earn our money to buy our groceries and we still have to pay taxes and we still have to do all those things but don't let that be our focus let that be the things we need to do to live and not live to do those things father for some that are here today that that anxiety that comes from imagining you being near is because they've never become a follower of jesus They've never willingly or knowingly come and turned away from their sin and placed their faith in what Jesus accomplished on the cross to be enough to save them. They've never surrendered to your right to lead and be boss. I pray today, God, that that would be their heart's cry. They would say, I don't want to be anxious about that anymore. I don't want to be anxious about the struggle I want to know the one who is the deep water the still Father I pray too because I know there are some people here today that are going through some stuff and the enemy wants them to turn inward he wants to isolate them And even in a group of people like this, they're sitting there and they're thinking, nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody gets it. God, I pray that you would draw them to you. That you would remind them that you are near. They don't have to go searching for you. They don't have to wait until they feel emotionally driven by your presence. They don't have to wait. They can trust in the knowledge of the truth of your word that says you are. I pray, God, today they would turn loose of all that stuff they're holding on to that's trying to protect them from others when really what it's trying to do is isolate them. And then, Father, I pray too, because I know regardless of whether someone's walked with you for a long time and their eyes are on heaven constantly, there are times when our eyes are diverted. Incline my heart to your testimonies was what David said. So I pray that you draw us to you. Father, don't let us leave here today carrying the same burdens we carried in. trust you in your sovereignty you chose to spare us from the storms that could have ended our lives you're still near you're still good we pray it in Jesus name